Hello and welcome to another episode of the B2B Leadership Podcast. My name is Nils Vinya, and today my guest is Ryan Brown. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nils. It's great to be here. Excited to uh, spend some time with you today. Thanks, man. Same here. So before we get into it, uh, would you share with me and our audience the role that you're in today and the company that you work for? Yes. So I'm the vice president of customer success at a company here in Utah called Connect. Uh, Connect was recently named one of the fastest growing tech companies in Utah, uh, one of the fastest growing companies in America. Um, We offer a text messaging solution for small businesses. So we focus on dealerships, marine dealers, uh, RV dealers. We also service uh, law firms and uh, specialty retail through offering a text messaging solution where they can interact with their customers via text message, collect payments via text message, gather reviews via text message, and uh, communicate with their customers through through text messaging platform. Okay, now that's pretty cool because there are some, you know, we spend a lot of time in the B2B world and there's a lot of advancements that you know, get made on the communication front and, you know, how companies engage with their customers. But sometimes parts of society that we interact with haven't exactly caught up to some of those things. So it sounds like you guys are filling that gap. Yep. Yeah. We all, we all text our family. We text our friends. We text mom on the weekend, whatever it may be. Yep. We, we want to communicate with businesses in that same way. And so that's why Connect exists, is to help small businesses communicate with their customers via the preferred method, which is texting. Oh, so. That's fantastic. All right. So there's a situation I'm going through literally right now where <laughs> uh, one of my kids' doctor's offices uh, uh-huh. sent us a bill, right? Normal stuff. And there is a phone number on that bill. There's a fax number and there's an address to send a payment. That's it. I have called, literally, I refuse to send a check. I think it's just the dumbest thing <laughs> yeah. in the world. It is just pointless, right? Unless you're dealing with some big amount, I'm going to hand it over to somebody in person, checks are irrelevant. And I've called them like probably three to four times over the last two weeks. I can't literally get a hold of anybody to give them a credit it's, card it's number. Such a pain. You want to pay them. <laughs> online. They would have had my money weeks yep. ago, yep. but they didn't have your selection, your solution in place. I would love to send them a text and say, here's my Here's my information. If, if we serviced the medical space, dental space, we would be all over that for you. So I, I, I look forward to when you do. Let's say that. <laughs> awesome. Now, in being based in Utah, I know there's a lot of terminology around Silicon Slopes and whatnot. So um, give us a little sense, you know, of what the environment from a tech and SaaS perspective is really like inside of Utah and how it's changed over the last few years. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and first off, I love living in the state of Utah. So many great recreation opportunities. Yeah. Really, a, a, you know, family values uh, are really important here in Utah. So um, a lot of companies care about work-life balance and certainly connect where I'm at is that's one of the major reasons why I'm here is they understand that. Um, I've been in the SaaS space now for more than a decade. And in that decade, we've just seen extreme growth in Utah and the moniker of Silicon Slopes has really come about in the last, you know, five to 10 years. And um, there's just so much growth potential here. So much, so many companies that are doing so many good things here um, that I've seen just in the last decade, uh, these companies sprout up everywhere. And there's a few different local colleges here. So there's lots of young Mm. talent. Um, uh, A lot of the tech talent in, in the Silicon Slopes area is just tremendous. That's wonderful. And I've had many clients and known many businesses that have either set up shop in Utah as an extension of theirs or, you know, relocated perhaps to take advantage of some of the incredible environment. Um, exactly. That's there. So yep. I always love visiting. That's hands down for sure. It's one of my favorite places. And when uh, the, you know, CS100 Summit hosted by Client Success is there yes. in Sundance, that's kind of a, a high point of the year for me, for sure. Getting to yep. go and visit and hang with hang with the crew. Yes. Um, All right. So let's turn back the clock a little bit. You're at the VP level today, but I want to go backwards and find out how this whole uh, journey unfolded. And would you share with us how you got into your very first leadership position? Yes. So uh, finishing up my undergraduate degree, I was studying at uh, Utah Valley, uh, which is a university here in in Utah County and uh, was working in a global training 
department. And um, I was one of the trainers. Uh, I, I loved the training space. Um, and that led me into my career around change management, when, which I'm sure we can uh, get to here in, in yeah. a little bit. But I uh, was in the, the, the training space and uh, my boss uh, had decided to leave the company. And that's really when I had my first opportunity to step in as a leader. And, and oddly enough, I never had to interview for the role, didn't uh, just hmm. was kind of put into the, you know, managing this training team now. And uh, I was very excited about it, wanted to be the leader of the team. I would have applied had there been that opportunity, but was just kind of given that role. So uh, that's how I kind of got into my first uh, my first leadership position. So just out of the blue, like your <clears throat> boss leaves and then they said, Ryan, that's uh, Monday morning. You're now the leader of the team. Exactly. Is that about it? That's pretty much <laughs> it. <laughs> Well, that that I mean that story is pervasive across a large percentage of the B two B world. So it's yep. fascinating. All right, so now you're in this environment of which you wanted to be in, and you were yep. hopefully marching down that path anyways. But it was thrust upon you, and you were in it, um, never having been a people leader before. How did you navigate that situation? And now all of a sudden, you're responsible for the team that you were part of just on last week. Yeah. Yeah. I look back and think, oh man, I really blew it in that, <laughs> in that situation. So many, you know, so many learnings have taken place over the years and look back at that first leadership opportunity and, you know, going from a peer into a leadership role, having not ever really been in a, a leadership role before. I, I completely missed the mark on so many things like, uh, you know, the need to invest and develop people invest in those mm -hmm. individuals and help them progress like that. That wasn't even on my radar back then. For me, it was more like, Hey, I'm the guy that's in control. Uh, I can call the shots now. You know, mm -hmm. I'm excited to be the guy that people are kind of looking up to and, you know, kind of more of like the, it was good for my ego type of thing, but I'm sure the people that were reporting to me didn't quite <laughs> enjoy it as much as I was enjoying it. So. Well, and, and that is a really great point that, you know, we can get, this happens all the time, right? You get, somebody gets promoted and there's a lot of excitement, which is wonderful. And there's a lot of enthusiasm and openness to do more and go above and beyond. But the whole enablement side of how to be a great leader just doesn't really come into to picture or doesn't exactly. even, isn't even aware. You're not even, you said you weren't even aware of these things. Exactly. Um, and the default is, well, they put me here because I'm obviously the smartest or something, right? <laughs> and I'm in control, so I should be calling the shots. So, um, you know, when you're going through those early early years uh, where that was the mindset, just because you didn't know any different, um, what was the result and how did the team react to that kind of an environment as best you can remember? Yeah, it, it was difficult. Um, you know, there, there were individuals of, of all ages and experience that were on my team and and, you know, I, I think back now and put myself in their shoes and, and think, you know, here's some, you know, young guy that's kind of stepping in first time leader. And you got people that had been in training space for many, many years and their mm -hmm. experience and their knowledge. And, you know, it, it just feels like, um, you know, I, I missed the mark in so many different ways there because they have such great experience and I didn't really understand how to tap into that potential, nor mm -hmm. did I really know the role that I needed to play in helping them grow and finding within them the opportunities to progress and, and provide additional leadership opportunities for them. So really, wow. uh, you know, it was it was a, a struggle early on. And, and uh, I'm thankful that I obviously had that opportunity that led right. me to, you know, learn more about what it means to be a leader and, and, uh, but certainly without its, without its mistakes early on. So. No doubt. And, and I, I honor you for being open and sharing that you screwed up. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> right? I did too. And virtually every other guest on this podcast has talked about a fairly similar story when they got into this, because the fact is that the, um, the act of promotion happens all the time. The act yep. of preparation does not happen very exactly. often. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And it's only through um, a long period of time that you get to this point where we're going to find out how you came to understand all these principles and these things that totally are 180 from where you were in that very beginning time. Yep. So yep. 
let's let's start to go down that path. Um, was there a particular pivotal moment or experience that kind of gave you the insight to say maybe this isn't the right thing? Maybe I'm not shouldn't be the one calling the shots here. Like, what was that awareness building like? Yeah, for me, um, sadly, I didn't really figure that out during that role. I was in that role for a couple of years um, and decided to go back to graduate school uh, and studied organizational change with, with an emphasis and uh, a business degree with an emphasis in organizational change. And it was during <clears throat> that schooling that I started to, you know, I, I was dealing daily with like, vision, creating a vision for an organization mm -hmm. and uh, building a framework for driving change and the importance of communication and and getting input from individuals, you know, all, all of these things that kind of go along with change management. It wasn't until I was going through grad school that I started to recognize like, oh, wait, mm -hmm. I really kind of blew it in my first opportunity here as a leader. <laughs> um, and there were so many things I'd go back and change. But I started in that in grad school to recognize the need to be more communicative. And, you know, you don't always have to be the guy with the answers. You can rely on your team and the collective, the collective genius of the team to help move things forward and change management's more about the vision and, and helping the team recognize uh, the potential that's within them to accomplish a future state of greatness that you're aiming towards that really kind of helped me start to learn those principles of, of good leadership. Wow. Okay. So the fascinating thing is that you were working inside of a great organization, right? And there was this great opportunity, but what I'm hearing is that the point at which you learned the most important and impactful elements of leadership was when you actually were <laughs> way outside the organization in a grad it. school program, only because you literally chose to emphasize on organizational development as a, yep. as a focus. Is that yep. fair? Yeah, that, that's totally accurate. It does seem a little bit weird. It, it, you know, I had to kind of step out of the step out of it for a minute in order to recognize yeah. what I needed to do before I stepped back into it. And so yeah. that time during graduate school, studying organization development and change was really key for me and in, in uh, the future growth that I would have as a leader. Yeah. And you and I went down very similar paths because I had similar issues and challenges, uh, largely with the being on the receiving end of mm. the not so great leaders in all the companies that I worked for. And then when I went to grad school, somehow all the pieces came together and everything started to make sense. And I too focused on yep. organizational development and it was in management and leadership. And it was, it was fascinating, but it was completely outside and had nothing to do with what was going on inside my company. It was just this other yep. place that I had to go to get this. And it seemed odd that they were so different and that yep. there was no integration of either any of this learning or any of this training or anything inside of the organizations I ever worked for. Yeah. And, and you, you point out something key there, which has really hit me is, you know, it, although this sounds kind of harsh, bad leaders breed more bad leaders. Yes. And so, you know, the, the examples that I had at the time, um, not saying that they were bad leaders, but I didn't really learn what I needed to learn through mm -hmm. watching them as leaders. And so, I look yeah. back now as the VP of, of my department and think, you know, what's the example that I'm setting for my team today? Am I, am I being the type of leader that I would want and expect them to be mm -hmm. to put them in a good spot to advance in their leadership career? And so yeah. it really has, you know, that's been eye opening for me to try to put myself in their shoes and understand what is expected of me and how can I be a better example to them so that there's, you know, generation, the next generation of right. leaders has right. an example to kind of look back on. And, and that's, that's a really good point that we learn by observation, right? As human beings. And yes. we're, we do this from the day we're born. That's <laughs> how we learn to walk, how we learn to talk. Like fundamental human development is based on observation. Yep. Um, and it's no different in the leadership world, but I think, and I love your opinion on this, oftentimes there's too much emphasis placed on observation. And it's like, oh, well, you're being promoted, just you know, follow this person and you're good because we're not going to take the time to go send you to grad school or build an MBA program or anything like that, which is fine. But that observation piece plays such a critical role. Sometimes it's great 
and mm-hmm. a really good indicator. And sometimes it might not be. Um, so I'm curious for your take on on that. And, you know, just how to somebody in a situation today, maybe they don't know what is right and don't know yeah. what is good. They just have only seen what advice would you share with them to take a step back and measure what should I be actually following? Yeah, that, that's a great point. And you're right. Some of that is observation. My, my advice would be, you know, as we're looking to develop the next generation of leaders is get them involved in important projects, give them opportunities to be exposed to the type of work that they're going to be doing or would be doing in that next role, whatever their next role is. Mm-hmm. Give them those opportunities to actually partake in doing some of that work and being exposed to the types of meetings they'd be involved in or the types of projects they're going to be working in and and build the relationships at that next level with the individuals that they would be communicating with. So um, I find myself now, you know, it, it's less for me about me being involved and owning everything like I maybe thought I should have been when I first became a leader and I'm the guy mm-hmm. in charge and I should be doing everything and calling the shots to where now I want my team to partake in that and be a part of that so that they're exposed to what they need to be exposed to, to learn and, and, and make those mistakes, but do so in a way where I'm there to help and assist and to maybe, you know, nudge in a certain direction or mm-hmm. give feedback mm-hmm. on this or that and, and uh, kind of help them in a safe environment, grow the skills that'll be necessary for them in their next role. Yeah. And that, that safe environment, um, I think is, is so critically important to, to growth and development. Like we've all enacted and worked in probably some not so healthy and not so oh, safe environments. Yep. And the amount of growth that happens in those is very, very, very small as compared to an environment like the one you've yeah. created. Right? It's based in fear, right? Like yeah. nobody, nobody succeeds when there's that environment of fear that if I make a mistake, you know, I'm looking right. over my shoulder. You, you want to create that safe environment where people can express themselves. They can take a chance they can really, you know, have that opportunity to, to grow their skills. So let's talk about how to create that environment um, outside of, you know, what you said about exposing them to opportunities. But how do you really go about creating this safe environment? And what does that mean to you and your team? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I talk a lot with my team around creating alignment in who you are at home, who you are at work, who you are with your friends, your family. And what I mean by that is you just be yourself and you Mm -hmm. treat people the way that you would want to be treated. You know, yes, we're at work and yes, you know, metrics need to be hit and targets need to be hit. and, And sometimes we have to have those hard conversations, but you can't dismiss the importance of just being authentic with people, being vulnerable with people, Um, being real with people uh, and the impact that that has in creating an environment where they feel like they can succeed and have opportunities. And so I'm talking to my team regularly around like, uh, and even one of our, one of our uh, main values as a business here at Connect is team is family. And Mm. that's really the environment we're trying to create is this, you know, your team at work is your family and treat them as such and, and be real with them. Wow. Wow. That's that's powerful. Um, I, the alignment piece jumps out to me because there's, you know, I've certainly focused on that a lot in my life. I've heard relatively few leaders in the grand scheme talk about alignment f- uh, from that point. So would you share a little bit more with us about what specifically that word alignment really means to you? Yeah, yeah. I think back to uh, several years ago, um, accepted a job at a, at a local startup here at, in Utah and, um, you know, maybe was doing it for a little bit of the wrong reasons, big pay increase and, you know, some of those things and thought I would jump ship and, and try to make it work there. Well, turns out that um, for me, that, that job and the, the culture there was not a good fit for me and for my personality. And mm. so... Uh, it impacted who I was as an individual. I started, you know, not wanting to wake up and go to work in the morning and getting home. I I couldn't be who I needed to be for my children and for my wife because work was so stressful. And I just didn't feel like I was connecting with the, the leadership there and the culture there. And so that's when, for me, it started to dawn on me, like, 
there needs to be that sense of alignment with being able to be yourself and and not fear being yourself at work but also you need to you know just as you spend time with your people at work you i need to focus and and have that opportunity to connect with my kids and you know yeah. kind of have the the one on one so to speak with the kids mm-hmm. and and spend <laughs> spend time getting to know them and what interests them and what can i do to help my kids yeah. to feel like they're being invested in and growing and having opportunities to learn and exposing them to new things just like i would consider you know exposing people at work to new things to help them to grow and so that's when it really started to dawn on me like all of these things can kind of mesh together and if there's that alignment between who you are at home, who you are at work, who you are with your friends, then you're in this 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 position of strength as a leader and you can accomplish some great things when you've got that alignment. Wow, that's powerful, man. And thank you so much for sharing that. And what a great example that in that particular situation that you were in, you know, there were a lot of incentives and there were a lot yep. of things that ap- appealed to you at one point in time, more money, more title, whatever the situation was. Right. But yep. the reality was that environment didn't align with you at all and ended up being far worse for you as a person. And you gave it up because yep. it just wasn't going to serve who you were as a person, not only who you were as a leader, but it wasn't going to serve you who as a person. That's just not fair. Yeah. And I I think that speaks to the importance of culture and the Mm -hmm. impact that leadership has on culture Yeah, and how you need to really focus in. And and culture is something that you really can impact and influence every day. Everything is an intervention. That's what they, you know, in change management, they talk about everything being an intervention, even if you don't intend it to be. Yeah. Everything is an intervention. It's the same thing with culture. Everything that you do adds to or takes away from the culture of your team. And as a leader, it's so critical to set up that culture where people feel safe. They feel like they can be themselves. They feel like they can have that alignment between their home life and their personal life and their work life so that you create this space for them to really excel. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful just sentiment there. And just how it always reminds you just how big of an impact that you as a leader in any capacity, and even if you're an individual contributor, it still applies, how big of an impact you have on the people around you because of the, frankly, the amount of time you spend with these people, right? I mean, we spend more time engaging with the working world in our professional, like in company and network with customers and all those things than virtually any other group of people. I mean, even sometimes more in our families, right? And if exactly. those two aren't in alignment, it's really hard to feel good about one or the other, or you might feel good about one, but not the other. And yep, it's hard to, exactly. to have them in both. <laughs> and that is a delicate balance. So uh, wonderful to hear that you guys are fostering that kind of environment at Connect and you know, giving us some great advice and, and tips on how to think about culture and how to think about your role as a leader, not just from the things that have to get done, but from the environment that you create and how powerful that can be and how big of an impact it can have on somebody else and their family. Yeah. And, and we found you know, that Although this is a side effect of this, right? We're not creating the culture in order to retain employees. We're creating the culture because that's the right thing to do. But we found Mm -hmm. that through the great resignation, um, we've actually have staff that just, they just want to be here, right? Like they, they care about that alignment. It, it, it matches their, their personal beliefs Mm -hmm. and, when you can connect with an employee at that personal level and when that culture connects with the employee at that personal level, somebody calling with a little bit more money, they think twice and say, you know what? Yeah. It, it might not be worth it. Cause I'm going to this unknown environment or I'm going to something where I don't quite know what it's going to be like. Yeah. I know, you know, I'm expected to do a lot here at connect, but I know that I'm going to be treated the right way and that this culture is something that meshes with who I am as an individual. And so it helps to retain employees. So. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I want to get your take on this, which is kind of branching off from that. Um, the, the classic statement that people don't leave companies, they leave bosses. What do you think of that statement? I 100% agree with that. I, uh, um, wholeheartedly feel like, you know, the, the relationship that you have with your manager, the leaders, uh, that are working with you has a huge impact on, 
how you feel about yourself, how you feel about the role that you're in. Um, and certainly uh, people leave because of that or they stay because of that. And and uh, I've been uh, lucky to work with, for, with some pretty good leaders here at Connect that uh, make it a great place to be. So that's what, yeah, that's awesome. Love it. Um, so when it comes to, we talked about, you know, your experience in grad school and just being a totally different mindset shift and a whole new set of tools to put into action, big investment in yourself, big return. Um, over the years and even now at VP level, how do you continue that progress and continue to not, you know, rest on what you've known before, but to keep pushing yourself as a leader? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's something that I consider quite a bit, right? Like I, there have been times where I feel like I go through these cycles of growth and refinement and, mm -hmm. you know, um, th those times can hurt sometimes. They can be very motivating sometimes. Um, and then there's been times where I feel like I'm like maybe resting on my laurels a little bit or I haven't experienced yeah. the growth that mm -hmm. I maybe should expect of myself. And so... I think it's critical as a leader to um, surround yourself with those learning opportunities, um, podcasts such as this or uh, good books or, um, you know, I, I love watching documentaries. I actually learn quite a bit by watching or learning about other people's experiences mm -hmm. and, you know, like just just seeing the situations that other people have been put in and trying to you know, put myself in that situation and say, well, how would I have reacted in that scenario or what would I have done in that scenario? And so, you know, the media that's around us all the time, using that for your benefit to help your growth and, and your learning. Um, and then practically, like in the work environment, seek feedback from people. You know, don't, don't be afraid to ask for feedback. Um, be open to uh, others' thoughts and, and uh, you know, their, their input on how you're doing. So find those opportunities to seek feedback from uh, those that you trust within your organization. Yeah. Wonderful. Love it. And I, the, the common theme I'm hearing from you and, you know, when you took time to go to grad school and, and, and do that huge investment in yourself and then all these opportunities you're talking about right now is there's nobody sitting over you saying, Ryan, it's, time to go and learn something new. Here's what you should do next, right? <laughs> this is Ryan driving Ryan's yeah. per professional development and personal development too. Is that a fair exactly. statement? Exactly, yeah. And I, I think that's so important. What you hit on there is so important is just, you know, always having that desire to learn, mm -hmm. having that quest for knowledge and that thirst for knowledge, I, I think is, is so critical to a leader. Um, nobody wants to work, work for someone or be associated with a leader who isn't challenging themselves or pushing pushing the team to achieve new levels of success. And so we always need to be growing. We always need to be learning. And um, you need to find within yourself how to get yourself in a spot where you um, are doing that intrinsically because um, because of that, you know, excitement around growth and the excitement around learning that that goes with that. Yeah. And it's, and it's sometimes it's not easy, right? There's a lot of circumstances in our world that play yep. into that. There's a lot of time. There's a lot of maturity pieces that come into that. I mean, for the first almost 10 years in my professional career, I, the focus on growth was negligible yep. and my career <laughs> path and the results very clearly reflected <laughs> my focus on growth. But when it switched and when I went to grad school, just like you did, then it's been up and to the right ever since. But yeah. it was a decision that I had to make. Nobody could make that for me. Thankfully, yep. somebody asked me a very powerful question about, are you the CEO of your career? And my answer at the time was a resounding no, mm. right? Um, I'm curious, like we talked a little bit about this before and how you you know got to the um, going to grad school and whatnot, but was there a pivotal moment where you said, this is absolutely the next thing I have to do um, that got you to that major milestone of going outside and then getting your MBA? Um, I, I don't know that there's any one thing that I would, uh, you know, assign or associate with that. Um, what, one thing that comes to mind though, is as we've, uh, talked through this is the importance of understanding your own personal brand. Yep. I think that's so key in all of this is understanding, uh, kind of like what you mentioned there, like taking ownership over your own growth what is my brand and what do I want people to know me for? Mm -hmm. And trying to decide like, what is the one or two things that 
you know, if someone were to describe me at the work environment or, or even at home with your, with your wife or your children, this can be applied in any situation, but what, what are the one or two things that someone would say about me? And so Mm -hmm. I think it's that, you know, as, as I went through grad school and now as I'm progressing in my career, I'm thinking about that regularly about, well, what's my personal brand and how do people perceive me and what can I do to maybe alter that? If I feel like they might not think of me like I would want them to, how can I go and, and learn a new skill or, or, uh, you know, change my own personal habits or, or the way that I would interact with someone to match this brand that I want to portray. That's yeah, that's fantastic. Um, really great point on, and again, aligning with what you said before that that's a decision that you made. What's the personal brand I want to be known for? Yeah. Right. All right. So let me get your take on this. I think it's pretty well aligned, but I want, I want the alignment check with you. There's a great old saying, it's who you know. There's another old saying that it's not who you know, it's what you know. And then there's a third, which I think is probably most important, this is what I want your check on. It's not who you know, it's not what you know, but it's who knows what you know. What's your mm. thoughts on that? Yeah, totally agree with that. So, so many uh, opportunities that have been uh, put in front of me have been um, one, because of people that I've known, but two, uh, because I've cared and I've tried to challenge myself and tried to prove myself and show that I'm, you know, willing to take that next step and, and hungry to take that next step. So I think, uh, you know, that, that third one that you mentioned there. So, so important. All, all of those things mixed together really is what provides that opportunity for growth. Yeah. And that, and the personal brand feels like the underpinning of all that. And exactly. the best part yep. is you get to decide what it is. And if you don't decide, I can guarantee you somebody else will decide it for you. And it's probably yep. not going to be at the same level of detail or, or enforcing the same things you want. So you might as well take advantage and do that yourself. Yeah. And, <laughs> and oddly enough, so I talked about early in my career, just given that first leadership opportunity, Stepping into the VP role, that's how I got the VP role also, was I, mm. I didn't necessarily apply for the VP role, but was in a situation where I had proven myself and there was a need and I was just uh, given the opportunity again a second time, yep. um, this time with more experience and more uh, <laughs> knowledge than maybe what I had the first time I was given yep. a, a, a new leadership role. Um, several years back, the, the first time stepping into a VP of customer success role, I was in the exact same situation, but felt much more prepared to yeah. step in and really guide an organization um, based on what I'd learned through grad school and, and the, the jobs that I had had between then and now. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. Um, and it kind of hits on an interesting point about, you know, oftentimes there can be some tension or contention in our minds, in our relationships with our companies that, oh, I want to be at a certain level by X time. And I have this five-year plan and it's get to this level and then this level and this level. Um, and what you just described is much more um, just, you know, by nature of doing the work, by nature yep. of proving yourself, you put yourself in a position to get into that, you know, VP leadership role even though that wasn't, you know, your math part of the master plan that said, well, in six months, I have to be in this VP position. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. And I think what you hit on is so important. There is I'm, my personality isn't such where I'm the guy that's always going to be knocking on the door and say, hey, you know, look at look at me. I, I try to be the guy who um, I go to work and I, I prove through mm-hmm. my actions. I prove through my performance that I'm ready. And so um to me, as I'm looking at future leaders, I'm really hoping to find those individuals who kind of follow in that same, that same approach of show up to work, you know, be humble, be yeah. confident, mm-hmm. prove, you know, prove through your actions mm-hmm. instead of through your words that yeah. you're ready for that leadership role. And, and um, you know, that's really to me such a powerful thing is that the individual that's um, – you know, even though they may be a top performer, they don't, they don't gloat about it. They don't, yeah. you know, try to push others down. Like leadership is, a, is about helping others around you be successful, not trying yeah. to cast the light on yourself, but <laughs> cast right. the light on those around you. And so that's what I've tried to do, you know, since my, the, the early days of not really knowing what a leader <laughs> is, is cast the light on people around you and give them those opportunities to shine. And it's yeah. within doing that, that 
you then also, you know, the, the result of that is you looking good and, and performing the way you should too, and, and putting yourself in a position for growth. Yeah. Yeah. And then when the opportunity arises, you know, there's a, oftentimes it's a no brainer type of decision. Well, yes. clearly Ryan has proven himself. He's done X, Y, Z. He's supported the team in this way. There's really only one choice, right? Yeah. And that's ultimately the, that's what I call the byproduct of all the work, right? Yeah. Yep. So we're focused, like we know what the end goal is and kind of, you know, can paint that in our minds of where we want to go to have the little bit of vision destination in mind. But the day to day is all about doing the work and proving yourself so that when there is an opportunity, you can either present yourself or it will be a foregone conclusion at that point. Yep. Yep. And I, I've been lucky enough to be the benefactor of that. Mm -hmm. That's not always going to be, be the case, nor has yeah. it been since then. I've, I've obviously had to go through that process just like everybody else. But putting yourself in that position, um, I think, is, is such an important thing. Yeah, agree. All right, uh, Ryan, last question here. If you were to go travel back in time, knowing everything that you know today at this point in time mm. and sit down with your younger self when you were getting into that first leadership role with that <laughs> team that you told us about um, and had an opportunity to sit down, have some conversation, share some advice with your younger self. What advice would you share? Well, I, I might slap myself on the side <laughs> of the head first. That, might, that might be the first thing I do if I find a time machine, but um, no, I, I think, you know, some of the most critical learnings that I've had as a leader is, is really, it, it's about the people around you. Mm -hmm. It's about investing in those individuals. It's about finding the right people. I mean, I, I've learned so much about like resisting the temptation to just hire the person, the first person that becomes available because you're so busy and the yeah. need to like go actually find the right person for the role, even though it may hurt to keep that role open, finding the right people, investing in those people and, and holding high expectations of people. I, I, I think I probably feared um, holding high expectations for my team early on mm -hmm. when in reality, I think people thrive and are excited about those high expectations. And I felt like I was maybe doing them a service by, trying to be friendly and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and making the job fun. Whereas now it's those high expectations and accomplishing great things and accomplishing excellence is where the, the satisfaction and the joy yeah. can really come. And so I think I'd probably have a conversation with myself about those things. Wonderful. Great advice. Awesome. Well, Ryan, it's been an absolute pleasure to spend some time talking with you about your leadership journey. Uh, really love the incredibly incredible environment you're creating with your team at Connect. Can't wait to see all the great things that you and the team are doing and I look forward to talking with you soon. Yes. Thanks for having me on today. This has been, it's been a joy. Thanks, Nils. Take care.